Thank you very much for being here, everybody. Uh, thanks for the introduction. Uh, introduction. I want to thank uh, several people, Jonathan Elmer, the uh, festival's artistic director, for inviting me to be here today. Um, Eric Slaughter, professor at the University of Chicago, who's organized a seminar session later on. Uh, and the festival staff, particularly Rena Rinali and Tiffany Beatty, for um, making my stay very uh, enjoyable and my, my arrival very smooth. So um, it's nice to be here. Uh, as um, you just heard, this is, I'm going to be talking to you um, about some of the material in my book, which is coming out next, ne next March from Basic Books. And basically, this is a book that addresses the question about why so many people feel frustrated by sleep. Um, it's become an activity that people feel they need to train themselves and their children to do. And there's a pervasive sense that people are doing it wrong, that somehow they don't know how to do it. They've forgotten how to do it. Um, and how, how is that the case? It's become an activity that people you know, sort of micromanage. They're popping pills, buying products, reading books, consulting experts, um, as if somehow they're going to learn the right way to do it. And um, it's a very peculiar uh, kind of phenomenon, especially since we live in a time when more is known about sleep, both its processes and functions, how it works, why it happens, um, what goes wrong and why something would go wrong with sleep um, than ever before in human history. Sleep science is a fascinating field. It's advancing leaps and bounds. Every year you can find major findings reported in the news, you know, like clockwork every few months. Um, and it's also a strange phenomenon, this widespread sense that sleep is broken, given that um, more comfortable and hygienic sleeping accommodations are available for a wider number of people than probably ever before in human history. So um, my approach to this, I'm trained as a literary scholar, but I've done a lot of work in uh, social his what might be called social history of medicine, um, is to look at this as a historical problem, that there's something about the way our society organizes, its, organizes itself around sleep, the, the rules and the expectations around sleep that are a mismatch for the way people lead their lives. Uh, and to give you some sense of the, the magnitude of the problem, we have over 2,500 sleep clinics in this country alone. Um, there are 75 classified sleep disorders uh, from garden variety insomnia to such fanciful sounding uh, problems as exploding head syndrome, which is a condition I don't know if anybody's ever experienced it, where when you're falling asleep, um, you, you experience a loud crash or banging sensation, uh, or, or it can also happen while you're waking up. So terrifying, and a whole range of things in between. Um, we have a multi-billion dollar uh, sleep industry involving things like pharmaceutical sleep aids, um, sleep products. The number of gizmos and gadgets that are related to sleep that are on the market are just astounding. We have uh, anti-snoring pillows. We have smart beds that can monitor your body motions as you sleep and how much you perspire and time them, you know, synchronize those with um, you know, your, your pattern of micro awakenings during the night and then can feed that information into the web and be part of an aggregate so you can sort of judge how you're sleeping. We have uh, dental devices that, that can be used to set your jaw in such a way that your airways won't be obstructed while you're sleeping. And some of those devices even have smart chips in them that can record your breathing patterns and align them with your sleeping patterns. Right? I mean, just an unbelievable proliferation of devices. We also have a number of sleep services, including uh, new kinds of niche uh, professions. Um, uh, companies, Fortune 500 companies, now often hire napping consultants to, um, <laughs> to help uh, create a, more, a better rested and more efficient works, work, workforce. Some wealthy parents hire sleep coaches to help their children get on a schedule. Okay, so we have all of this mess around sleep, and we have thousands of sleep hygiene, sleep training, and sleep health books and articles published per year. Mine will only add to that, obviously, but I'm taking a different uh, kind of approach, I think, than most of these, by looking at sleep as a historical problem. And, you know, when we think about sleep and history, the two don't seem quite to fit together because we tend to think of history as what happens while people are awake. You know, you, you fight wars. Yeah, you, you, um, you, you travel to the moon, you, you, you run an election, 
you know, you, you build a factory. These are historical actions all undertaken by waking people. Sleeping people do not participate in them. And yet, all of these activities are kind of silently organized around the human need to sleep. Um, sleep researchers uh, refer to something called sleep pressure, which is basically the steadily mounting force that gathers throughout the day, and you can either reduce it or, or increase it, depending on, on what kinds of activities you're involved in. And, and it's just always there with it. And we, when it reaches a tipping point, we have to go to sleep. It's, it's present, and it's a, an actor in our history. And it's a sort of har hard thing to get your mind around, but everything we do, every, every home that we build, every highway that we design, has to sort of keep sleep in mind in a strange way. Um, now, if I were to kind of ask the uh, people in the room, about what defines a good night's sleep. What, what is it that we're told we're supposed to do when we go to bed? We would probably have fairly broad agreement about some basic rules and expectations surrounding sleep, um, even, if we, even if we tend to honor some of them in the breach. This is what we're told is, constitutes a good night's sleep. And before I show you the list um, that I've come up with, um, I, what I want to say about them is that every single, every single item on this list is quite new historically, and that almost nobody followed any of these rules anywhere in human history before the last couple of hundred years. <clears throat> the first one, two kind of go together. Do all your sleeping at night for about eight hours. Sleep in one, one straight shot through the night without waking. I mean, that is sort of, that's the kind of cardinal rule of a good night's rest. And yet, uh, historian Roger E. Kirch um, wrote a wonderful book about 15 years ago called A Day's Close. Uh, night in times past, in which he showed that um, across a broad social spectrum in Europe and North America, um, at nighttime people tended to sleep in two shifts with an interval of as much as 90 minutes to two hours. It was often associated with um, rit rituals of various kind, either lovemaking or prayer, dream interpretation, and so on. And that this sort of evaporated. And the, in the, in the 19th century, sleep tended to be consolidated. It was a more efficient way to package sleep in an emerging industrial economy. And E. Kirch also uh, really highlights the, the, um, the force of the spread of artificial light, particularly electric light, in changing sleep patterns. So that's a relatively new expectation. Um, get yourself on a schedule with regular bedtime routines and try to stick to it, except maybe for weekends and vacations. Um, this is actually, I mean, it, it seems intuitive, right? And it's often given to us as the key to getting a good night's sleep, getting yourself on a schedule, and particularly doing it for children. Do it this, more or less the same way. Virtually every sleep hygiene book you can read from the mid-19th century through much of the 20th century will, will tell you one version of this and give you a system for how to do it. Um, well, it, you know, if you think about it, um, we know that sleep is, sleep's timing is in a, a very powerful relationship to the rise and fall of the sun and to changes in temperature throughout the day. And that, that the changes in natural patterns of light and darkness uh, vary drastically by season in most parts of the world, unless you're living close to the equator. And there are many reports um, from 19th century of travelers to far-flung regions, particularly closer to the poles, of um, of people essentially shutting down in the winter, uh, coming almost close to human hibernation. And this was a survival technique. If, if those folks had, had tried to put themselves on a schedule to sleep in a healthy way, according to what we're told, um, they probably would have died, right? I mean, you know, you sleep more during times when there's less protein and calories available to you. Um, you want to, and when it's colder and you're conserving your body heat and there's, there's a lower amount of light, um, to, to sleep the same way in winter as you do in summer makes absolutely no sense. Um, sleep in a private, specially appointed room with at most one consenting adult, right? We're supposed to sleep in private. Uh, in many societies still today and through human history, sleep has been a public uh, phenomenon, and, or at least a social one. Um, the idea of co-sleeping within the family and sometimes among uh, non-family members, even strangers, has been common throughout history, and now it is a kind of, a kind of taboo. Um, it's a, it's a, a phenomenon, too, that um, 
that I think really has ecological consequences, this insistence that everybody have their own space. Because, of course, in the way we manage our sleep today, the idea of having separate bedrooms in a middle-class family home, it's almost like a, a necessity of middle-class family life. Again, something that wasn't available to uh, large numbers of people anywhere in the world until the mid to late 19th century. And as these homes got larger, they used up more and more resources. Um, so that's a, a kind of novelty as well. And then the final one, and this is such a powerful one, and it, it really is a key to how we have uh, been led to um, think about child development. Send a child off to sleep alone through the night in a space apart from families. In many societies, and at most times through human history, this would have been considered, A, totally unfeasible, and B, cruel. Um, Co-sleeping has been the broad norm through human history uh, in, one form, in one form or another, and it's often in many societies that still practice it. Uh, it, it's, it, it is um, key to fostering intergenerational closeness and kind of family intimacy, right? But the, there's a kind of moral force to the idea in our culture that children need to be off on their own. It's about cultivating individuals, and that's a very kind of modern Western ideal that um, has fairly shallow roots. And then the last thing is, you know, sleep is a medical issue. And if something goes wrong, you pop a pill, you consult a, a physician or another expert, you read a book to help yourself do it right, or you just consent to feeling miserable. Um, I want to start, I want to talk a little bit about a story from my own life that opens up onto the force of these sleeping rules um, and their fragility, the tenacity to which we cling to them, even in difficult circumstances, and the ways in which those rules that I've listed create conflict. And I want to say they create two kinds of conflicts. The first kind of conflict is a, essentially a psychological conflict. I can't sleep by those rules. There's something wrong with me. I have to learn to do it the right way. Um, I'm not getting a good night's sleep. Or within a, a, a family, there might be interpersonal conflicts. You know, that kid needs to go to bed, right, and doesn't want to, and won't stay in the bed, right? Uh, a kind of intergenerational warfare often takes place over sleep, or between uh, adult partners, right, one of whom are, who may be on different work schedules, or one has primary parenting duties and has to get up in the middle of the night, typically a woman to, you know, to breastfeed or, or, or whatever, to care for the child, uh, there, there's often a kind of gendered battle over, over sleep. That's one set of conflicts. Another set of conflicts involves, um, and this is sort of a, a, a more expansive view of the role sleep plays in our world, uh, there are social conflicts around sleep because the rules that are given for you know, healthy, um, uh, proper, middle-class sleep don't apply to everybody. Um, and, and those people for whom it doesn't apply, either they don't have the resources or the means to sleep in the expected way, are often m in extremely vulnerable situations at night. Um, so the story that I want to tell, I was in, this was in 2005, I was living in New Orleans with my family, had two young children, five and three at the time. And we had used this book, this well-known method, the Ferber method, for getting our children to, to sleep on their own. Um, and it's, Ferber has sometimes been referred to as the sleep Nazi uh, because <laughs> he was, uh, his system was notoriously kind of draconian about how you enforce this uh, nighttime separation. He said bedtime means separation. Uh, and it was a method of getting your child to, you, you allow your child to cry for say 10 minutes before you go in and comfort the child. Uh, and then, you, then the next time you wait 15 minutes, you stretch it out. Um, and over a period of days or weeks, eventually the child will figure out, you know, I'm not going to get any relief from this being alone business. And um, so I might as well stay here and sleep through the night, right? That's how it's supposed to work. And, um, uh, and under no circumstances are you to pick up the child. You comfort the child with your voice only. So it's really a, a kind of anti-co-sleeping um, method. Ferber laid off it a little bit in a, in a later version of, of the book, but he, st he basically stuck to the essentials of this, of this uh, procedure. Now, so we tried this, and it, and it actually did work, but it was exquisitely painful for everybody involved. Um, 
uh, and we had to do it over and over again. My son kept getting ear infections, and we'd, we'd get him on a good sleep pattern and then you know, have to do it all over again, and the crying and you know, the anguish, and should we really do it? Shouldn't we just you know, put, bring him into the bed? Um, but we stuck with it, and it more or less worked. Um, well, as I said, 2005, New Orleans. I came home from work one day, looked at the weather report, and here's what I saw. Um, OK, oh, <laughs> crap. What do we do now? Storm is going in this direction, so we're going to go in that direction. And among the many things that we had to prepare for quite quickly, you know, we had about 48 hours notice to get out of town, um, was where were we going to sleep? Where, where, and, and it was important to us not just to find safe harbor, but to find a space that would allow us to kind of recreate the conditions for middle class sleep that we had fought so hard to achieve, right? We didn't want to let, you know, we didn't want to let all that effort go to waste. <laughs> so, so we got a place in Shreveport, Louisiana, a city I had never before visited, and I may again someday, who knows, um, <laughs> that was like this. OK, it was a hotel suite. Parents could be back here. There's a door. You know, we could talk. We were anxious. We didn't want to upset the kids. We didn't want to bother their sleep patterns. We didn't want them to bother us. We could turn on the television, watch the news, right? So we had recreated in the midst of this disaster that, that uh, you know, scenario that we were kind of fighting to, to, to hold on to. Um, and we were fortunate. You know, we had some money in the bank. I had connections that could help me out in a pinch. Don't worry, we were fine. The house was fine. Um, we made out OK. Um, but you know, as we realized what had happened to our city, we were looking at the news, we saw very different images of people um, trying to sleep. And what you will notice in these images is that uh, among those rules that I listed for what normal sleep is, what healthy sleep is, what good sleep is, none of them are even thinkable. Um, you know, sleep in private, forget about it. When you can't, don't have the means to get out of town, you don't have a car, you don't have money to get a, a, a hotel suite, whatever, sleeping in private, unthinkable. Um, sleeping on a regular schedule, you'll notice the light coming in through the windows there, forget about it. Doing all your sleeping at night in one straight hour shot, forget about it. Separating out the generations, providing separate spaces for children and from parents, not thinkable. Not, not thinkable, not imaginable. It would be horrendous to even try to do it under these circumstances. You can see similar uh, photos of refugees the world over um, trying to sleep. And these are often the most poignant images we see of people going through calamities. Um, there was an interview with Barbara Bush, uh, who is in Houston at the time looking in on ev evacuation center, Barbara Bush, the former first lady and the mother of then President George W. Bush. When she looked out over the scene, she said something that, and I don't want to kind of you know, pile on Barbara Bush um, for these comments, but they were really, I think, indicative of a kind of set of assumptions that we have about sleep and society in our world. She said, so many of the people in the arena here you know were underprivileged anyway. So this is working out very well for them. Um, so uh, the for them is what I emphasize. There's an us and a them. And there's a long history behind that us and them, which again, I know, I'm sure she wasn't aware of, wasn't thinking, didn't intend, but it's there. And the ways in which we think about sleep, I think, are subtly connected to ideas of, of privilege and power and race in our, in our country. And, um, and they have long history that goes back to the days of slavery. Here's an image from uh, an abolitionist periodical in the 19th century showing the condition of enslaved Africans on a transatlantic trans slave ship. Sleeping huddled together, uh, possibly chained to each other, um, looking weary, wakeful, but exhausted. Uh, and commenting on the, um, the wretched sleeping conditions of slaves was sort of a staple of abolitionist discourse in the 19th century. Um, but 
what's sort of upsetting was that it was also a staple of pro-slavery discourse, talking about the differences between the races in terms of sleeping patterns. Um, so to kind of deepen this idea, I just have a couple of phenomena listed up here. In 1788, the Br British Parliament addressed the kind of unhealthy conditions in the slave trade and passed a piece of legislation called the Dolben Act. And they noticed that these um, kind of collective sleeping arrangements were unhealthful not only for the slaves but also for the white sailors who were often made to sleep among the slaves in the hold in order to provide you know, surveillance. And so they, uh, the Dolben Act, it did decrease the overcrowding of the slave ships to some degree, although slaves were still left to sleep in the hold in rather large groups. But what it really did was it, it mandated semi-private sleeping conditions for white sailors. And white sailors, by this point, working on slave ships were about the sort of lowest socioeconomic position you could have. Uh, it was often, you know, people who had been sprung from jails or who, you know, who were unemployed uh, or, um, you know, had other reasons they couldn't find other positions in society. But they were given a modicum of privacy and comfort aboard the ships in the wake of the Dolben Act. The Common Housing Lodging Act in 1851 was another British um, uh, piece of legislation that legislated the need for private lodging in English factory dormitories. Basically, there were a number of public health officials who were sort of surveying these dormitory lodgings and found, found they were breeding houses, <coughs> excuse me, breeding houses for all kinds of disease. And um, you know, the idea was m many diseases were airborne, um, including, they thought, cholera, which of course now we know went through the water supply. But, um, but this was a major factor in trying to kind of separate out people's sleeping space, and especially, you know, this took place at a time when Europeans were encountering different kinds of sleeping arrangements in different parts of the world, and often saying, you know, that what characterizes Europeans, what characterizes civilization over savagery, was the need to sleep in private. Um, and William Whitty Hall, who was a physician who wrote one of the most popular sleep hygiene books of the 19th century, went through many editions, he exemplified this and he was talking about how co-sleeping societies are like the vilest and the filthiest of the animal kingdom, wolves, hogs, and vermin who huddle together. In contrast, civil, for civilized whites, instead of several members of a family sleeping in the same bed, each child, as it grows up, has a separate apartment. And what's startling about this was how new that was. Separate sleeping rooms were not of, simply not available to most white people until the kind of the turn of the 19th century. And yet by the middle of the 19th century, it becomes a defining feature of civilization. And it's something that I think we still carry with us and it has this um, sort of dark history. Um, when slaves were taken to the New World, they still f found that um, sleeping in private was not an option. This is Mount Vernon, so this is one of the better um, kind of sleeping and more private sleeping accommodations afforded to, to slaves. Um, and as I said, abolitionist writers often wrote about the wretched sleeping conditions of slaves. Um, this is Theodore Dwight Weld, whose uh, powerful book, American Slavery as It Is, is one of the f you know, kind of first collections of testimony about the abuses of slavery. And he talked about uh, you know, the slaves uh, all sleeping together in one apartment that served the purposes of sleeping, cooking, etc. Some are furnished with a temporary loft. I've seen a whole family herded together in a loft 10 feet by 12. In cold weather, they gather around the fire, spread their blankets on the ground, and keep as comfortable as they can. And then he talked about slave coffles, you know, slaves being taken to market. Um, he said they're fastened with handcuffs, um, galled by iron collars and chains, and thus forced to travel on foot hundreds of miles sleeping at night in their chains. And, and this book, as much abolitionist, abolitionist writing, is just a powerful source of writing about injured sleep. And in fact, the literature on slavery as well as the literature on, on all kinds of poverty is often a kind of chronicle of how to get a really terrible night's sleep. George Orwell's Down and Out in Paris and London, uh, you know, about the two years he spent tramping in those two cities, um, 
uh, is just full of, you know, you get kicked by the police, you get robbed, you get molested, you know, uh, it's, it's quiet, it's, it's loud, it's, um, you know, you're out on the street, it's uncomfortable, hard surfaces, uh, et cetera. Jacob Reese's How the Other Half Lives is just full of documents about wretched sleeping conditions. Um, what's strange, though, in the American context is um, that these different sleep patterns were often blamed on the um, people who experienced them themselves. And that, that somehow the idea that the races slept differently was taken as evidence of the fact that there were differences between the races, which was often a, a sort of a justification, became part of the justification for slavery itself. We're going to have a lecture later today, I know, about Thomas Jefferson by Annette Gordon Reed, and she's written about Jefferson's tortured history with, with race, and I'm sure we all know about it. But in his notes on the state of Virginia, he talked about uh, sleep and slavery. And he says, you know, Negroes just seem to require less sleep. And he went on and elaborated. I, I'm going to move forward uh, in the interest of time. But essentially, he, um, he sort of justified overworking slaves um, and working them as long as they possibly could because there was a, you know, a, just a different requirement for sleeping among, among the races. And it was connected also in his mind to the differences in intellectual levels. Um, it was an idea that was taken further by Samuel Cartwright, who's a notorious physician in Louisiana who studied um, the medical condition of slaves. And he was uh, sort of effusive on the subject of sleep. And he talked about that the differences in race, you know, he wanted to show that w one race had kind of natural capabilities that the other didn't. And that these differences came in part, in large part, out of the sleeping state. And what he said, basically, to summarize what's up there on the, on the screen, is that black people, when they go to sleep, they, because they need more warmth, they have a tendency to cover their faces, either with a blanket or with a piece of fabric. And so they then breathe in their own breath, and they become sort of oxygen depleted. And they don't get enough oxygen flow to their brains, which leads to a, um, a, a state of essentially arrested development. And in this state, he said, Africans are like, because of this, they are like perpetual children in need of being uh, supervised constantly by whites in order to, to behave correctly. He also, uh, Cartwright was famous for developing certain disease categories that only applied to people of African descent. And one of them was a sleep disorder in which an ensa enslaved black person becomes like a person half asleep. You could imagine him sort of seeing somebody who's just chronically exhausted, falling, stumbling um, out of either overwork or wretched <coughs> sleep conditions. And he says, that, well, that's a sleep disorder. And it's only, it's only to, it only, real, it only applies to slaves. Only they seem to have this one. Um, and in that state, they have difficulty being aroused and kept awake, and they tend to break waste and destroy everything they handle. The cure for it, hard work, hard work in the open air. Frederick Douglass um, wrote a lot about sleeping conditions of slaves in his, uh, 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 in his memoirs. Um, and he wrote that more slaves were whipped for oversleeping than for any other. So the idea of controlling the sleep-wake cycle was an important part of controlling a, a, an enslaved population. And he talked about a state of mind that maybe was something similar to what Cartwright was observing, of being so exhausted that he stumbled through life and couldn't even think uh, he said, occasionally, you know, uh, a, a spark, a faint beam of hope would, would course through me, but I was so exhausted that I couldn't act on it. Um, he describes basically being broken by intentional efforts to deprive him of sleep, and that this was part of the breaking of the will of the enslaved population. So I give this history. It's sort of a backdrop. Sleep researchers have looked at some of the lingering effects of this without looking at the history itself, right? And it's now widely known that there's, there are great differentials in sleeping, uh, different sleeping patterns among uh, different races that are most pronounced if you compare white to black in this, in this country. Um, and those differences in sleeping have themselves have powerful effects on other health issues. So being prone to diabetes or lowering your, um, your immune system's capacities. Um, are effects of, of poor sleeping. Um, if you're not sleeping well, 
you're more prone to accidents when you're driving or operating machinery. It also may have some effect on uh, such things as test scores, right? If you're chronically exhausted, um, you can hardly be expected to perform at your peak. And so what uh, this ar article by L Lauren Hale and Huang Do published in 2007, it found that you know, that seven to eight hour ideal, um, only 55% of the black uh, uh, subjects in the study kind of were able to manage that, whereas 67.6% .6 of whites. And it was basically a matter of being clustered at either end of the pole. Less than six hours, well, we know what that, uh, the, some of the consequences of that. What was surprising, in a way, was uh, almost double slept for the number of um, uh, black uh, subjects slept greater than nine hours as compared to the whites. And s sleeping in excess, it can be you know, a matter of depression or it can be an effect of other kinds of health issues that require you to sleep longer. So again, when we go back to that idea that you know, there are these rules around sleep and expectations for how we sleep, the patterning of sleep and so on, um, they, they have a long history and those histories are, are related to, um, to the social world that we've built and that we've inherited from past, uh, from past times, sometimes you know, without our knowing it. Well, I want to tell one more story. This is another story from my um, personal life. It's a happier story. <clears throat> and it cuts in a completely different direction. Um, some of you may recognize this man that I'm standing with. Um, this is former President Jimmy Carter, who is a faculty member at my university at Emory. He runs the um, Carter Center, which is a wonderful organization uh, that you know, goes to um, eradicating uh, um, eradicable diseases around the world, voting rights protections, which we may need some of in our own country, <laughs> um, uh, human rights issues generally. And uh, every semester, he invites a handful of faculty members to meet him for lunch at the center and to ask them about their research, um, something that caught his eye or the eye of his assistant. And, um, uh, and he tells us about the good work being done in the, in the center. So I was fortunate enough last spring to have an invitation to go meet with President Carter. And he was remarkable. He had you know, recently been through very aggressive treatment for, for cancer um, and came out of it uh, you know, hale and uh, vital and intellectually curious. I mean, he was an incredible um, kind of lunch partner. And he started, we sat down, and he started asking me about my project in some detail and how it connected to my other projects and, you know, how did an English professor get into this and, you know, and um, what were my methods, what, what sources was I looking at, what had changed about sleep over time. And I, you know, I was nervous, I was wearing a tie, you can see I don't like wearing ties. And um, I, I, uh, uh, so I, I, I hung with him and answered as, as well as I could. And, um, and at a certain point I decided to change the, to, to sort of turn the tables. And I said, well, what, what about you? You know, how has sleep changed in your life? Did you, when you were a kid, did you, um, did you sleep in your own room? And, and he said, well, yeah, I did. Um, but my sisters shared a room. And um, what, what, what's really changed, of course, you know, I was growing up on a farm in rural Georgia, and we didn't have electricity. So we all went to bed when the sun went down. Um, but it really changed when I got my first radio. And I would listen to the Glenn Miller Orchestra at 9 o'clock at night, you know, really changed. And then he kind of paused for a minute. He said, well, you know, I guess later in, in my life I did some co-sleeping. Uh, when I was running for president, you know, we were shoestring budget. And uh, so I had to share uh, some sleeping quarters with Hamilton Jordan, who was his <laughs> campaign manager. I think that's a scoop, by the way. I don't think anybody has, has gleaned that, uh, <laughs> that information from President Carter. And, um, uh, uh, and th of course, there, there are four of us sort of nervous, nerdy academics sitting at the table in the presence of this world leader, and um, we all bust out laughing. And the ice was broken, and other people started talking about sleep in their lives. And, and the conversation just really kind of um, became very convivial at that point. Um, and you know, stepping back from it, I wondered, well, why is that? Why did that happen? 
especially since so much of what I've been studying is the conflicts around sleep and the way sleep can, can underline and even exacerbate social distinctions that take place in the waking world. Poverty is nowhere near as extreme as it is when people are trying to sleep. The distinctions between high and low, nowhere near as great as when they retire to sleep. So how is it that sleep is also kind of this leveling force that can put me, me, you know, on kind of for a moment on an equal footing with the president, right? What, what is it that's shared about sleep? And my answer um, has to do with this little creature. <laughs> um, that's a parrotfish. And a parrotfish uh, is kind of remarkable in terms of sleep because it, when it goes to sleep, it spits out a packet of foul-tasting, somewhat poisonous goo, and it sleeps inside it so that predators won't attack it. Sleep is a condition that all, all species share, not just all humans. We all have to shut down for a certain portion of our existence. And this shutting down makes us extremely vulnerable to predators, to thieves, to people or forces that would do us ill. We can't, we can't defend ourselves. We can't provide for ourselves. We can't plan. We're immobilized. And we all have different ways of, of uh, forming protections around ourselves. That's what we share, is that, that vulnerability of that part of our lives. And it's what kind of made it feel so intimate to talk about it even with somebody like President Carter. And I've had conversations with cabbies that were kind of the same. And, um, and yet, the inequality comes in because our society distributes protections for that vulnerability very differently. You know, humans have homes, alarm systems, police force, electric lighting that can, can ward off thieves and people who would do us ill. But these are not available to everybody. And as the, the, um, the story of Katrina and the history that I sketched out about sleeping on the slave plantation illustrates when you don't have those protections, when you live in a world in which you are not granted the protection against your vulnerability, um, sleep becomes an ordeal. So as you're sleeping, going to sleep at night, you know, maybe wrestling with your pillow and it, it's not going so well for you, you know, I, I would just leave you with this thought that um, you may feel that something is wrong with you or, you know, and that you're facing this alone. But um, maybe the problem is with the rules and expectations that your society has about sleep. Uh, and those rules, it's important to remember, apply to different people differently. Children, parents, rich, poor, powerful, and powerless. And all of these struggles have their place in history and are born out of history. So you really never sleep alone. Anyway, thanks very much. Forty years ago or so, I went with my husband to Costa Rica. He's a botanist, and we at one time went to a finca, which is like a plantation. There, the main house had a generator. The workers' homes had nothing. And the what? I'm sorry. Workers' homes. One of the workers' wives was about my age. At that time, I was 30. She was, she was two, I assume. She looked like 50. Teeth were gone. She had eight children. <laughs> and I remember thinking what they need is electricity <laughs> because they could do nothing. Yeah. Well, uh, it's a double-edged sword because, of course, the electricity um, will uh, provide for all kinds of um, resources and entry into connection with other communities decrease isolation and, and, um, and so on. But at the same time, it's going to disrupt sleep patterns. And there have been a lot of studies done by anthropologists about what happens to um, communities as they acquire electricity. And they find that you know, uh, once you get electricity, then you get TVs. And once you get TVs, parents want to stay awake and watch the TV while putting the children to bed. And that becomes a powerful force for kind of separating out um, uh, sleepers within the family. It also, once you get you know, all of the, the amusements and, and activities that go along with electricity, it tends to push people's sleeping time later. The idea of leisure time in the home is something that is a much more powerful force um, at night when, when the home is electrified. Yeah. I, I have a uh, practical question. <clears throat> for people who have a tendency to grind their teeth mm -hmm. while they sleep, 
My dentist has said that the use of a night guard uh -huh. is good, and I wanted your opinion on that, <laughs> <laughs> and, or, and or any other yeah. sleep guys that you might have for people who grind their teeth. Okay, right, sleep. great. So my dentist said the same thing to me, and I tried it for a couple of nights and then, and then put the thing in a drawer. I don't know what's happened to it. Um, I, I'm, not a, I'm not a physician. I'm not a sleep, uh, I'm not a medical sleep expert in that way, so I, I don't presume to you know, address anybody's particular you know, disordered sleep or complications with sleeping in that way. Um, so I am probably not the best one to respond to about whether or not to use it, but I will say that that is part of the incredible proliferation of sort of sleep concern in our society. Virtually every medical profession now has something to do with sleep. There are people who specialize in the sleeping positions of patients, like which ones will make the, you know, affect the cure in the best way. Um, and uh, so, you know, it, this is, it's now, it's now a matter for dentists as well. It's kind of extraordinary. Over on this side, over here. Hi, Ben. Hi, Michelle. Uh, it's lovely to see you, and this was such a fantastic lecture. I'm um, just so impressed by the very creative and yet very rigorous ways you're explaining and exploring this notion of sleep. And I, I love those topics where we don't even realize it's a topic, uh, especially as you put it, because um, history isn't made necessarily by those people who are asleep. <laughs> um, I can imagine sleepwalking, right. sleepwalking or yeah. somebody asleep at the wheel, you know, that kind of thing. Uh, but I, what I was thinking about was I really loved um, what I heard to be an implied critique of these sort of racist discourses about, well, slaves are inherently um, inferior and we can see that in your sleeping pattern and you move into the critique that, well, what they're ignoring is what the body is doing that's creating that sleep. Yeah. And then I was thinking when you were moving up to the contemporary moment, um, how I, I wanted to trouble some of the statistics because if it's about labor or one of the reasons is labor, then it makes sense to me that some of the statistics would be more useful if we focused on class yeah. um, because not all black people are doing that, the same thing. That's a great thing. point. And I've actually been in close touch with Lauren Hale, who was the person who conducted this study. And she pointed me to a number of sources that, um, that did control for socioeconomic status. And that they're basically, uh, they, the, the, the distinctions still rem remain. So in other words, African Americans of roughly the same socioeconomic level, same level of education and income, still um, sleep in, you know, with, it, with almost as much of a difference from the typical white subject. And so that leads to two thoughts. You know, one is it has something to do with the sleep environment, that more African Americans live in, in cities which are noisy and harder to, you know, harder to um, uh, find quiet, restful sleeping space. And the second is that um, the effects of discrimination don't go away when you go to sleep. And in some cases, so if you think about being, you know, I'm, I'm a parent of two teenagers. I've never had the talk with my son about, you know, what do you do if a policeman stops you, right? But every African-American father has that conversation with their kid. And when the, the kid goes out at night, do you think the parents are sleeping well? Um, you know, so there, there's a lot behind those, uh, those statistics. Despite our, our efforts to get past it, would you say that the natural human sleep rhythm is the first sleep, second sleep? Mm. Um, I am kind of agnostic on the question of whether there's a natural pattern or not. Again, I'm not, and I'm, I'm, I'm sort of talking to and with a group of evolutionary biologists who are studying this um, at Duke University, and um, there's all kinds of fascinating work. There have been some uh, both historians and anthropologists who question the idea of the two sleeps being a sort of default mode, right? And I think one thing that we, that we do know about sleep, human sleep, is that it's incredibly flexible. Um, and people sleep in all different kinds of ways in different settings. Sleep is very much responsive to our environment. So, you know, an Inuit person living in northern Saskatchewan who is off chasing caribou all day during the summer, you know, well into the, the wee hours while there's still sunlight, uh, is gonna have a very, very different kind of sleep pattern than somebody living near the, the equator um, who, you know, has a very different kind of, uh, you know, work rest uh, uh, system. And, and human beings seem to be adapted, and there are some theories among evolutionary biologists that 
human adaptability to different kinds of rhythms is part of what has allowed humans to live in so many different parts of the globe. On this side. Yeah. Hi. I was wondering, are you familiar with the uh, composer Max Richter and his composition no. that came out last fall? It was called Sleep. No. It's an eight-hour composition. He worked with, <laughs> he, he worked with um, neurosciences, neuroscientists. And, oh. Um, oh, that's great. Yeah, it's beautiful and it's fascinating. And um, the premiere of it, he actually had mattresses for the audience. Wow. Yeah, and what was interesting is um, I actually stayed awake one time to listen to it. And the part, you know, when you're falling asleep, it's really beautiful, but there's actually parts in it that aren't um, beautiful at all. Uh, are they associated <laughs> with different stages of sleep yeah. at all? You know, because uh, sleep, you know, one of the things I learn in, in getting to know the work of sleep, sleep scientists is that sleep really isn't one thing. It's any more than waking is, right? You know, you say, what's it like to be awake? Why are we awake, right? You know. Um, there are zillions of reasons. Sleeping comes in very different stages, and um, so slow wave sleep is a very different phenomenon at the level of the brain and endocrines and all kinds of bodily processes than REM sleep, you know, that incredibly high activity sleep, and I'm doing this because that's w what an EEG readout looks like when you're in REM sleep. It goes haywire. You're even more active mentally when you're in REM state than you are during waking life. And the, this, the deep sleep, the profound sleep, the one that the alarm clock won't wake you up, is like this, right? Um, so it's, it's kind of a mistake, and I, you know, I'd be interested to hear this piece and whether it tries to give some sort of artistic representation of these different, different phases. Yeah. I have a number of friends who um, are Hispanic, doesn't seem to matter which country they're from. And they practice co-sleep yeah. with intergenerational. And I'm wondering whether there have been any studies that you're aware of that indicate um, whether families raised like that, they're closer, they yeah. have less arguments, they're mm -hmm. more interested in their nuclear family than other yeah, the community. there have been a number of anthropologists who study co-sleeping societies, and they tend to find that family structures are, are closer, that there's less intergenerational conflict. If you think about what does it mean to be a teenager in this society, um, it means to be in rebellion against your parents. And that's not, uh, and sadly I speak from experience, and the, um, both as a teen, former teen as, and as a parent of a teen. Um, and, uh, uh, you know, I, I think that one could trace that to the history of like, first of all, you know, from a very early age, going to bed is this thing that you have to do according to the rules of your parent, right? And you're supposed to, but then also, going to bed is a place where you are in a different world from your parents. And we stress individuality and autonomy, and then when we get it from our teens, we don't like it so much, right? Um, and in many societies in which co-sleeping is the norm, that seems to be kind of less, less of an issue. So I'm not saying everybody should go you know, sleep with their teens or whatever, uh, but, um, <laughs> it does, uh, <laughs> but it does, it's but it's a really interesting observation, yeah. We have time for just a couple more, and I'll start over here. Um, you talked about uh, prescription medicines, uh, and, and I'd like you to elaborate more on the short-term and long-term effects of that. Like, Well, for many of them, uh, long-term effect, long effects are completely unknown because, you know, the latest class of, um, of sleeping, widely prescribed sleeping medications, Lunesta, Ambien, and so on, uh, have really only been around for... 15, 20 years, they re replaced the earlier sedatives. And so nobody really knows what happens to you after you take them for a long time or over a course of a, a lifetime, how it might affect you. And there's a new class of um, sleeping medications that works completely differently from those. Uh, and I think it's marketed under the name of Belsamra. I don't know if anybody has experience with this particular medication, but it, most sleep agents work by, um, by sort of increasing the sleep juice, you know, in your system, right? Um, the, the chemical flow that induces sleep. And Belsamra works by 
by suppressing the neurochemical called orexin that keeps you awake. So it shuts off awakening. Um, and it's like all of these, every time a new sleep aid comes on the market, the claim is always it doesn't have the nasty side effects or the health risks or the risks of addiction that the earlier ones do. And, but then once the patent wears off, magically it's always, you know, turns out that, well, there were a lot of risks, so we need this new thing. Um, so there's a lot of entrepreneurship and hucksterism around these, around these pills. Long-term yeah. effects aren't, aren't really known. Sorry, last question. Uh, my wife has uh, epilepsy, oh. and her neurologist, when he meets with her, will prescribe this medication or that medication, but he's also said to her, a more, a just as important as any other medication is sleep yeah. as a medication. I was wondering if your book addresses that. Uh, yeah, a little bit. I mean, I, I actually write, so my last book was about insane asylums in American culture, and um, I one of the things I noticed as I was studying these spaces, they were kind of first psychiatric institutions in the 19th century, was that the physicians were obsessed with getting their patients on a sleep schedule. That's part of what led me to this, um, to this current project. Oh, have I been dinging this thing? Um, but, um, uh, and many physicians in the 19th century saw sleep as kind of the universal key to good health and getting people on a proper schedule as uh, not, not a panacea, but as a sine qua non for, for all kinds of health issues, mental health and otherwise. <clears throat> um, so, you know, but the, your question also raises another issue, which is about, um, you know, people with chronic illnesses or disabilities for whom sleep be, becomes a sort of add-on, a tacked-on ordeal that they go through. You know, that um, if you are a person who has uh, a, um, you know, a physical disability, um, often being on other people's schedule is an extraordinary challenge, and that applies to sleep. There are certain kinds of medical conditions that um, are, cause great pain at night or that themselves produce sleep interruptions. So looking at that population of people as well, um, there are great sleep differentials there, and the, the rules of, of um, kind of contemporary sleep often don't or can't apply. Well, I want to thank uh, Professor Rice, uh, Reese for his presentation. Sorry. Thank you.